Hey guys, Matt, Iron Trap Garage, and today in our Hot Rodding 101 series, we're going to do a deep dive into an East Coast style hot rod. We're going to be using my Pagoda City Coupe, as I have dubbed it, uh, to show you guys some of the things that make the car give it that style that instantly makes you think of an East Coast style hot rod in this instance. In this video series, what we're trying to do is not give you every single detail and, and holy uh, Bible of what you need to go by, but more some ideas for you to jump off of and in these particular series about the vehicles, show you some of the pieces and parts and modifications that are done to achieve this look if you're going to try and build one of these cars that's in this style yourself. So let's get started. All right, so let's do a breakdown on this particular car. So the first thing I'm going to mention is that East Coast style cars, it is a very broad term and over the years the uh, channeled and unchopped look. Some of the cars started to get pretty crazy looking. The channel got really, really, really deep on them. And some of the styling just kind of followed with the time. So I built this car to more of an early style um, East Coast car, so to speak. So a lot of the cars you would see in the later years, they do not have a flathead. They have a Hemi or whatever overhead valve engine in them. But on this particular car, this is what I chose. I'm doing more, this car is definitely more of a mild uh, type build that um, is supposed to look like something that was done back in maybe the early 50s and was put away and, and then I found it like this, but it's something that I built uh, myself from scratch. So let's start with the channel and the frame and how all of that's done on this car. So particularly, this car is channeled about five and a half inches. Again, the roof is unchopped and uh, the frame I actually built from scratch using uh, just box tubing. You could use a Model A or 32 frame, whatever you would like. This particular one at the time when I built this, I decided to use box tubing and build it from scratch. I tried to make the frame look like an original frame as much as I could. So I put uh, Model A front and rear cross members. I welded on the front Model A horns to give it that look. The frame has been stepped in the rear, I think like nine or 10 inches. My memory is getting a little foggy on it. And in the front, I actually have the frame pie cut so that the front of the frame kind of sweeps up. A lot of these cars to get sitting this low, they would oftentimes stack the frame in the front. If they were Z'ing it, they would double Z it and stack the frame front and rear. This particular car for looks, I didn't like that look. So I ended up just cutting the frame and moving it up and doing it that way. Um, the chassis and the body are mounted together definitely in a more professional manner than what would have been done back in the day. A lot of the early cars, pretty much all of the channel cars I've ever seen back in the day, where basically they just took whatever cutting implement they could take and they just torched, hatcheted, hacksawed, whatever they could do to cut out the original sub rails and all of that stuff, just leaving like the rocker strip at the bottom and a little bit of the door jam area and they would drop the body down over. Sometimes they would turn the frame diagonal and slide it in the body and then turn it sideways. And they would either weld it right to the frame or they'd just make some little tabs or brackets or put some wood on and that's how they mount the body. As we've gone over the years, we've realized that some of that is a little on the sketchy side because the body isn't really mounted very well. It would also cause the car to have the doors not shut correctly. The car would have a lot of air leaks in it when driving around. So what I chose to do was actually build a floor. I built, built some inner uh, rockers on this that come up and actually go into the floor with some box tubing and then they tie into the original door sill. So I have that just covered in some uh, some rubber floor mat, but that is a good way to do it instead of just a lot of the early cars you would see when they would channel them. That whole door sill area would just be open and you could just see the frame and where they torched it up. So in my case, I did a, an actual floor in the car and built a structure in it. So when you're driving the car, it does feel solid. The body isn't flopping all around and uh, makes it a lot more safe. All right, for, so for the suspension on this car, when building an East Coast car, this could go all over the place with how it's built. A lot of the, most of the earlier ones that I've seen, they en generally end up using a Ford, uh, a later Ford flathead type rear. I have a 41 to 48 rear in this car um, that has obviously juice brakes from the same era on it. The front end is where a lot of differences end up happening with these cars when they're built and you just have to choose what you want to do yourself. I have a Model A front cross member with a 32 to 34 style uh, drop axle. It is a Moore drop, which is just one of the companies that were making them. It is more of a taffy type drop um, with a reverse eye front spring and I might have like one or two leaves taken out. So it gets the car sitting nice and low. I have, I have split wishbones 
with some brackets that are mounted underneath the, uh, inside the frame, they're kind of bent out to keep the um, wishbones close to the body uh, to get the caster right on this. I ended up pie cutting the wishbones right behind the yoke, leaning the axle back, welding that all up. Some of the stuff that you'll see in this car, like I mentioned with the body and the floor, we've learned over the years some better ways to do things. Um, we have a little more information than these uh, kits did in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. So some of these modifications were things that were probably done on a little higher end cars or race cars, but we, used, we still use those techniques nowadays. So getting into the engine and trans, I, went, I opted for an earlier style, East Coast style car on this, and I went with a flathead. This has a uh, 24 stud flathead. This one's actually a 41 flathead. It's not a 59 AB, but it is that style. Um, the engine's just been mildly uh, modified. It's basically bored out, bored and modified to like a stock Mercury APA um, type standards. Uh, we have fixed in high rise intake, and uh, we have, I actually have Petronics hidden in a stock distributor on this one. Still running the generator converted to 12 volt. Um, I have some headers that are just simple type headers that are on here. And then of course we have uh, a recent addition I put on here I've been wanting for a while is these fixed in marine head covers. These are basically just a dress up item. They were made for boats. The speed equipment, all that stuff you do if you're looking for an East Coast car, really that doesn't determine what makes it. It's really the channel and uh, unchopped look that we're going for. The transmission is basically a 39 Ford transmission with a shortened drive shaft. All that stuff is pretty standard for early type flathead powered vehicles. Um, it very much drives like an old raw hot rod with that Model A rear suspension and no, hardly any sound deadening or anything in this car. It is a little bit of a rattle trap. It is quite loud. Um, but it's really fun around town. Um, with the stop, with the 378 gears in the rear, um, this car is more of a zip around town. You can take it on the highway, but really when you're going 60, 65 miles an hour, it ends up buzzing pretty good with this flathead. Putting highway gears would definitely make the car a little more drivable on the highway, but I like this. This, this car was more built for a fun back roads around town type rip car, race some hell around your town, and not something that you would be taking necessarily cross country with the setup that is currently on it. Okay, so next we'll jump into the wheels and tires and a little bit of the exterior styling on this particular car. For the wheels and tires, this is a question we get all the time. This car is running uh, 750 16 rear tires or Firestone uh, tires in the rear, and it is 550 16s in the front. It actually has 35 Ford 16 inch wire wheels on it, but I've chose to put a set of reproduction lion style uh, wheel covers on it. They cover up the wire wheels on it, gives it kind of interesting early look when people would start covering up the, the uh, wire wheels to give it a modern look of a steel wheel, and that's what I've done on this car. Now as far as some of the styling goes on it, I have the iconic 32 grille on the car that uh, most people were putting on Model A's and things in that era. Uh, I chose to channel the grill down to match the body. Uh, it's about five or five and a half inches it's been channeled. Um, I chose not to put the grill and radiator in front of the cross member. So that required us to chop the radiator down or section the radiator down. So you do lose a little bit of cooling capacity, but uh, it keeps the radiator and the, the uh, grill kind of in line with the axle like it would have been instead of having that stretched look of putting the grill and stuff out front. Another interesting thing that I have on the car that I thought is a cool look and you started seeing a little more with these cars is I had opted to put a pleated uh, roof insert in it. So originally this car would have had like some chicken wire, some wood, and then some um, fabric that would have went on top. By the time a lot of these cars were starting to be built, especially with the way I'm building this where it's more of a average guy type build, um, my thought process was the roof probably, he probably would have got this car and the roof was, the car was second hand and the roof might have been you know, kind of tattered up at that point. And what do you do? You throw a roof insert over it so you're not getting wet and you put a little bit of pleats in it. The pleats match the seat and the interior. As far as that goes, we just have a simple black uh, vinyl type seat that would look kind of like a Naga hide or something. It has some simple pleats in it. And also I opted for a 32 pickup dash in this particular vehicle. I use the 32 pickup dash because it actually fits a little easier in a Model A. You only have to trim the edges a very, very small amount. And you can actually, with the bolts that held the dash in from factory, you can drill the, uh, the windshield header panel there and, um, 
and put threaded inserts in there and the dash will bolt in like stock. So that's what I've done on this car. Worked out really, really nicely. I then took a stormwater gauge panel, the inside panel, put that in there with a handful of gauges. It's a pretty simple interior on this. Again, it's fairly sparse, but that's uh, wanted something that was more of an average guy type hot rod build. That's why we went for those type of things. All right, so for some of the mechanics of the vehicle, other than the engine and trans and rear, uh, is steering, brakes, pedals, that different type of stuff. So the steering in this car, I opted for an F100 box. One thing that I did on this car that uh, was something that's difficult to find parts nowadays and you have to make things. So in a lot of the old magazines, I would see where people on these channeled and heavily z cars sat really low to try and get the steering uh, the drag link angle to be a little better so that the car didn't have crazy bump steer. Guys are putting the steering boxes up on top of the frame uh, to get that, that angle a little more level. And they were making all kinds of crazy brackets, different things. But one thing I saw in some of the cars and magazines that I liked was they were using a Volkswagen bus uh, steering box and bracket or just the bracket on another steering box. So what I chose to do is take an F100 steering box which has quicker steering, better, better internals than the early Ford boxes and uh, milled off the machined off the flange and I basically made a recreation of the VW bus steering uh, bracket. What's nice about that bracket is it basically has like a, uh, a simple kind of 90 degree bend on it and it can go over like the frame rail and then it has a collar that actually clamps down on the uh, steering box and you can change the angle of the steering box. I really, really like that because when I was building the car and setting it up, I could change the angle of everything, get it just right, and then I basically uh, put some set screws in it that we put around it on, on top of having a clamping bolt so it kept everything in place. Uh, I ended up building the bracket so it looks like it's an old cast part. A lot of people don't even know that, but it's something I fabricated. You may be able to find those uh, Type 1 bus uh, steering box brackets, but I imagine like with early Fords, early uh, VW bus stuff has gotten quite expensive, and I would imagine those parts are as well. At the time when I was looking, I couldn't find one or they were very expensive, and I opted to just make one because I had more time than I had money. Now for the pedals on this car, this car actually uses F1 style pedals. I ended up using a Havler a House of Fab uh, cross member that is basically a recreation of the F1 cross member that you put into the frame and I chose to weld that in. I used his with some F1 pedals. The nice thing about the F1 pedals is that they actually house and hold the master cylinder all at the same time. So if you use a cross member that fits those pedals, you can put the master cylinder right on it and it kind of saves a lot of head scratching and, and, uh, and fabrication. Now when I mounted those pedals in there, obviously they weren't going to fit because they were out of an F1 pickup truck. I think 49 to 51 or 2 or something like that is what they were. Um, I had to shorten the pedals and heat and bend them and change the angle to get them all to sit right. But now with everything mounted in there, I have just stock 40 Ford style uh, pads, uh, pedal pads threaded into it. It all kind of looks standard at this point. I have a mechanical clutch on the car, again using uh, like F1 style mechanical uh, clutch linkage and that all worked out really, really well. The car has a pretty much stock like 10 inch clutch in it so the clutch feel is much like an original car. It's not anything that is uh, too difficult to push in. Okay, so before we take this for a drive, I want you to see what it sounds like and looks like going down the road. I'll give you a couple little tidbits on this particular car that I find interesting and maybe stuff that we get questions about a lot of times. So Pagoda City Coupe, we get asked about that a lot. Um, this particular car, when I bought this car, I bought it at the Wheels of Time show uh, probably 10 years ago or something. I can't remember at this point. Um, but basically the gentleman I bought it from said that he bought it from a friend who found it in Berks County area and it's pretty much always been in this Berks County uh, part of Pennsylvania. The Pagoda is a, is a very old building and it's kind of a tourist spot that's been around forever just about in Berks County and it is also used on an early logo, it's a Christmas tree looking thing, but it's a really, really cool spot and a lot of people used to call it Pretzel City or Pagoda City uh, was the nickname people would use for Reading area and I kind of took that Pagoda City thing because it's like my favorite spot to take an old car to in the warm months, drive up the windy roads, take that photo in front of the Pagoda, which I have 
couple of well-known photos of this car sitting in front of the pagoda and that's why I nicknamed it this. Now also on this car as the years have gone on I found a couple of neat little things for it. So probably the coolest thing I found is on the front of the car they used to give out when you would go to the pagoda um, and I think also on the turnpike they used to give it out in the Reading area at some of those stops was a tag topper that actually says Reading it has the pagoda on it with the Reading Pennsylvania and the pretzel on it. They are very sought after. A lot of the guys in our area go nuts for them. Whenever they pop up on eBay, a lot of our different friends will bid against the us against each other. And uh, I was lucky enough to find one or two of these just with going to swap meets. Total dumb luck. I found this one at a swap meet that a uh, uh, guy that sells all the time at swap meets forever and ever. He just pulled it out of his at the back of his van, he set it on the table as I was walking up and I was like, oh my God, made my month, year, whatever, and I had to go on this car. So I made two little tabs on the headlight bar and mounted that on there and I think it is perfectly fitting for this car and you definitely know what car it is when you see it. Another couple of cool things about this car is some of the stories about the parts. I think a big thing about all of these cars is the stories that go along with some of the parts that you find. So. Uh, this car has a bunch of stuff over the years. I've been driving this car and gathering parts and while I was building it, I was hunting for stuff. So one of the first cool things is it has a fixed in intake on it. Uh, this intake I wanted, I knew when I was building this car, I wanted a flathead with a high rise. Uh, early on, I, I couldn't find that stuff. I didn't have any of those parts. I didn't have uh, the um, collection like I do now. So I was hunting around for a high rise. I really wanted a Hawaiian high rise, but the, as they are now, they're quite expensive, hard to find. I happened to be at, um, I had asked Gene Winfield a couple of times because he and I did some stuff with Eastwood. He said, ah, nah, I don't have one. And then we, one year I was going out to Grand National. I was actually heading, helping him set up Grand National Roaster Show. And I mentioned again, I, uh, my, my engine was just about done. I need to find a, a better intake. I really want a high rise. He's like, well, why didn't you ask me? I said, I've asked you like three times. So he didn't ask me right, what are you looking for? And I said, I'm looking for a high rise. He's like, a fixed in do? And I'm like, uh, yeah, that would be cool. And he told me something that was sitting in his hot rod room on one of the shelves and it might have been off one of the cars he didn't remember. He had it for a long time. So um, I was lucky enough that he was able to sell that to me, ended up getting shipped out to me. I put it on the car. It was a great deal, I was super happy, thankful to have that. Uh, another thing is these really cool water pipes. I get a lot of people asking questions about these. These were actually like a hot rod accessory you'd see in some of the hot rod magazines or old uh, car magazines that they were advertised in the back. You see all the little tiny advertisers and speed shops and stuff. And you used to see these. They're cast aluminum water pipes that are made for flatheads. And they were all cast with the tubing in one. And you basically just slip your hoses over them, clamp them down, and you can run them on your car. And I think the gimmick or the idea, which may work a little bit, is that it would dissipate the heat uh, being thinned like that. Mike and I found that California, California, we were picking at one of our viewers, let us stop and stay on one of our trips to between Grand National and the Turlock Swami. And he had some, he had a property, it was his father's, and he had some falling down sheds on it that had parts in the back. And as always, when they say, ah, that shed's super dangerous, I don't know if you should go in there. Nobody's been in there in years. That's right where I go. So I went all the way in the back of the shed. I found a couple of Strombergs and some old hot parts. I found these, super psyched. Went home, put them on this car um, with a set of fixed in heads and uh, marine heads, and that's pretty much the rest of this history. Uh, recent addition to this car is I got a set of fixed in marine head covers. So um, originally they sold a set of aluminum non fin fixed in heads that had bosses on them to mount these covers. They were basically for marine use. Uh, but you started to see people using them on hot rods because it just looks cool. But basically the idea was it covered up the spark plug, uh, spark plugs and some of the spark plug wires so that if you had a boat and the water was splashing up, you wouldn't have problems with misfiring on your engine. So I've been looking for a set of these for a really long time. There's a lot of reproductions floating out there that don't have the fixed in logo uh, actually cast into them. I was stubborn and was trying to find an old set. So I found an old set, mounted them on the car. They look cool and just about one of the last major pieces on this car that I was hunting for for a very, very long time. One of the other things is like the headlights and the grill on this car. This is all stuff that I just found hunting around. They kind of match in color and that was just basically when I was out shopping for parts and 
auctions and swap meets in different places, I would see something like, oh man, that's that looks like it had been on the car forever. So I bought the headlights at an auction because I knew that that red color was kind of close to the car. It looked very similar. The grill was like old red oxide primer. I threw that on and it looked pretty good. And now that I've been driving the car for seven, eight years, I don't know, quite a while, six, seven years, let's say. Um, it's gotten dirty. I don't really clean the thing and everything's aging, as we call it, aging together nicely and it looks like it's been there forever. So super psyched about that. So a little bit of information about my version of an East Coast style hot rod and uh, hopefully that a little bit of information about what I used to build this and some of the things that we did will help you maybe have a jump off point if you decide you'd like to build a car that's similarly, similarly styled as this. Um, that information should hopefully help you out. Got to see this car driving in car. This is definitely more of a raw kind of hot rod um, that is definitely not uh, while it is refined mechanically and drives fine, it has its rattles, it has its squeaks, it's rough around the edges, but I think that's some of the fun of these old school hot rods is, is having a car like this that you can thrash on and drive, not really care, have a lot of fun in, and that's the most important thing at the end of the day is driving it and having a lot of fun in it, which I've done with this car a ton. Thank you guys for following along. Hopefully you enjoy it. Thanks. Catch you later.